This conference will now be recorded. Excellent. Jamie, uh, I don't think Nigel and oh, Ishan is already online, but Nigel isn't, is he? And uh, uh, I can't see him there just now, but don't worry, I'll 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 pick it up with him uh, in, uh, in in email if there's anything there, and I'll 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 speak to him. I can see I've got an email from Nigel. Um, oh. In fact, he's saying, please send the link. So let me um, let me send that through to him. Um, but you can get started um, and, and he'll then join um, once I've sent this link. Is that OK? Yes, that's fine. OK, so my name is uh, Joanna magus and I'm currently could, working for the university. Yeah. Joanna, just just to start with, would it be possible to just share your webcam just to so people can put a face to the name and then when you finish your introduction, we can get the screen, the PowerPoint on full screen and, and you can get started. Yes, but I've, I've shared already. It's not showing. Ah, OK, I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing it, um, but that might just be that might just be me. Oh, uh, I see my face. <laughs> you see your uh, face. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. That's fine. Then, then, then carry on. I would carry on. Okay. Um, so, as I was saying, I work for the University of Birmingham, and I also uh, currently work for the National Gene Bank in in Portugal. I am the program officer of the Quad Relative Specialist Group, and I have been working on various aspects of plant genetic resources uh, for many years now, namely on ex situ and in situ conservation planning. And I have been developing conservation strategies for crop varieties, land races, uh, plants, uh, threatened plant species um, from uh, various countries and various regions. And so, as Jamie said, this presentation will be divided by uh, me, uh, Aishan and Nigel Markstead. So, Aishan, perhaps you can introduce yourself now? Yes, uh, hello. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, so let me try and share my webcam with you so that you can see me. Hi, everybody. So my name is Aysan Delou. I work for Bioversity International, uh, where I'm the team leader for the Integrated Conservation Strategies uh, program in Bioversity. I have, uh, like Joanna, been working uh, for many years on the conservation of crop war relatives. Uh, leading that work in 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 biodiversity, so you'll hear more about me later on. Thank you. Over to you, Joanna. Uh, is Nigel already there? Yes, I'm here. I'll turn okay, my camera. Can you introduce Okay, so my name is uh, Nigel Maxted. Welcome, everyone. Um, I've been working for a long time on crop wild relative and land race conservation at the University of Birmingham. And um, conservation planning is one of the main uh, contributions of my research, uh, working largely with, as, as you know, as you've just heard, with Joanna and with uh, Aishan at Biodiversity International. Okay, so I guess we can start with our presentation now. Um, just a moment. Oh, okay. Let me just arrange this. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, wait. Ah, so in this presentation, um, as we said, uh, we, me, Aishan and Nigel will be talking about. So I will start with a brief introduction. Um, national, then I will go into national strategic action plans, steps in national conservation planning, and uh, with and then finally with plant conservation planning tools. Then Aishan will talk about in situ conservation implementation and how to involve stakeholder communities. And finally, Nigel will talk about linking conservation to utilization and about uh, conservation networks. So, efficient plant conservation planning is a critical first step to maintain plant diversity for the future. And what basically what we want is to recommend a network of in situ conservation areas that conserve priority plant taxa, 
to complement with ex situ collections of genetically representative population samples in gene banks. So uh, in this flowchart, there are some blank spaces, but don't worry because I will fill them in as we go along. We start with plant diversity, we plan for conservation of this diversity, and the results of this conservation planning will then on feed on to national strategies or national strategic action plans. So as I said, conservation planning means identifying an in situ conservation network and populations for ex situ conservation in gene banks. And these national strategic action plans then define a coordinated, systematic and integrated approach to uh, in situ and ex situ conservation. So they aim at uh, to raise awareness of the value of national plant diversity. They review the suitability of the current, current policy environment to support the governance structure and identify gaps and needs for policy change. They provide a framework and roadmap for long term conservation and sustainable use of plant diversity. They also define the specific actions and resources required to effectively conserve and sustainably utilize plant diversity. They integrate plant diversity conservation into existing national, regional and global initiatives. They make sure that the implementation of the objectives of the national strategic action plan are sustainable. And finally, they contribute to regional and global efforts on conservation and sustainable use. In this slide, you see uh, the elements of a, a national strategic action plan uh, concept that we have developed for crop pod relatives. Uh, and we'll make a parenthesis here about what crop pod relatives are. They are wild plant species that are cl closely related to crops, including uh, wild ancestors. And because they have a very close uh, rela genetic relationship to crops, they have an indirect use as gene donors for crop improvement. So therefore, they are an important socioeconomic resource that offers a novel genetic diversity that is required to maintain future, future food security. And in this example below, you have a wild crop pod relative, crop pod relative a beta maritima, that can be used or has been used, been used to confer resistant to um, a couple of, of uh, diseases in sugar beet, cultivated sugar beet. So going back to this slide, uh, a national strategic action plan uh, can have more very various elements that you can see in this in this image. <clears throat> Sorry, and the strategic and the concrete actions are central to this plan. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> and they basically, uh, so the concrete actions basically highlight what are the important taxa that are needed to be conserved. The sites for active in situ conservation. They also lay down an ex situ conservation program and include various public awareness activities. The strategic actions for the conservation and use of species, they basically are the policy interventions that are uh, uh, to enable concrete actions and the enabling conditions that are necessary to achieve the NSAP uh, objectives. And they can have uh, various other elements that, like the uh, policy uh, framework floristic diversity, introduction to floristic diversity. Uh, and and in, in the bottom, you see those elements that are needed to actually implement a national strategic action plan, such as the stakeholder collaboration, the resources that are needed, and uh, how to monitor and when to monitor and review the national strategic action plan. So this is a model uh, for the development of a national strategic action plan uh, that we have been developing and refining for years now. And I, 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 I uh, purpose, well, I, I erased crop pod relatives there on, in the title on purpose because I think it can be adapted to plant diversity, to any plant uh, uh, group. And you see three columns there. One is uh, the conservation column. On the middle one, you have the policy environment. And on the right, you have the utilization potential. And across in blue, you have planning. Uh, in green, the strategy implementation. In orange, the utilization of this uh, diversity. And in this presentation, I will be talking about basically conservation planning, which comprises these steps. It is a bit um, complex. Uh, uh, graph, but don't worry. 
Uh, I will focus on on these ones uh, on these elements first. Well, first no, uh, only. And in summary, plant conservation planning uh, starts with the generation of, plan, of a plant checklist. So which taxa exist in a certain geographic area. Select priority taxa. Uh, well, so which taxa are more important to conserve? And this plant, a plant taxa inventory uh, is basically a list of, of, of priority taxa with additional information that might be needed to uh, to afterwards we uh, conserve this taxa. Then we we undertake diversity gap and climate change analysis to select targets for conservation, target sites for conservation. Sorry. So where are priority taxa located, and are there any gaps in their conservation? And finally, recommendation for in situ ex situ conservation. So where should we actively conserve priority taxa in situ, and where should we collect for ex situ conservation? So let's start with the first step: generation of plant checklists. So first of all, we determine the geographic scope, whether we are looking at national level, regional level, sub-national level. We determine, determine the scope of the plant checklist, whether we are looking at all plant that exists in that uh, geographic area or certain groups. We annotate the plant checklist for prioritization and we make fi finally make available the checklist to users. And on the right, uh, side, you see a case study for Angola. So these, these authors, they explain that how they create a national flora checklist using only web-based uh, result uh, resources. And they finally created the floor, the floor of Angola online plus a hard copy. So we know, uh, so we have a plant checklist, so which species should we prioritize? Because uh, we all know there are not enough resources to conserve uh, all taxa, so we need to prioritize them. And so first of all, we should define the prioritization criteria. And for crop wide relatives, we usually use the, third, the top three. So the socioeconomic value of the related crop, the utilization potential of the wild species for crop improvement, and also threat status. But there are various other uh, criteria, criteria that can be used, like national distribution, global distribution, legislation, cultural importance, uh, taxonomic and genetic uh, uh, distinctiveness, uh, even recovery potential feasibility and sustainability of conservation of the wild species, current conservation status, and so on. So there are many criteria that have been used for various groups of, of species. So then you define a prioritization methodology. And here I, I just wrote, uh, I, I have two, the scoring procedure and the serial method. So scoring is basically assigning scores for, for each of the species uh, regarding each of the, uh, the criteria. And at the end, we sum all them up and we end up having a rank list of, of species. And serial, it's basically uh, getting, so we have our checklist, we filter that list for uh, a first criteria, and then those uh, species that were filtered with using the first criteria are then filtered for another uh, criteria and so on. And so finally, we apply the criteria methodology to the plant checklist. This can be made in Excel, Access, or any, in any, um, any information system. Here, a case study uh, of the SADC uh, crop relatives. So the Southern African Development Community is this area in green that includes uh, these 15 countries in, the, in Southern Africa. And it's important uh, area for uh, wild relatives various crops, coffee, cucurbits, eggplants, millets, okra, pulses, rice, sorghum, watermelon, etc. <clears throat> this region has more than 1,900 crop wild relative species. And so we cannot conserve all of them. So which are the highest priorities for conservation action? So in this case, we use only two criteria. Uh, criteria, the species that are related to crops important for food security. This was the first criteria. And out of these, we then selected those species with greatest potential for utilization in crop improvement programs, so using the serial methods. And this is just a summary. So first of all, we identify the crops that grow, that are grown in, in the region. 
then identified the crop variety yeah. species of crops. Sorry, could the person who just arrived, would you mind muting your microphone just so that uh, Joanna can carry on with the talk? Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. So we then excluded invasive taxa to the region because no one wants to conserve invasive species, of course. And we uh -huh. then um, identified yeah. those species with potential or confirmed uses in crop improvement. And we ended up, ended up having 100 crop relative species as priority in the region. That's just some example. Uh, so coffee, the coffee and millets are the crops with the highest number of relatives in the region. Because yourself, conference, conference. Conference. Hi there, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I just I can't see who's got the microphone on, but there's somebody who has their microphone on just now. Ah, okay, I think I can see it. I'm just gonna mute that just so that Brian can carry on. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so we know what are the priority taxa are. So where are they located and are they are there any gaps in their conservation? So first of all, we collate uh, occurrence data, we verify that data, we then undertake diversity analysis, which can include the hotspots, complementarity, ecogeographic diversity analysis. We then do ex situ and in situ gap analysis, climate change analysis, and finally with conservation uh, recommendations. So survey occurrence data, and that can be and, uh, with uh, field survey data, Herbaria and gene banks, both online and non-online, uh, scientific and gray, li gray literature, and also a very important the experts' knowledge about where the species occur. We then collate that data into a database, and here I suggest using the current data collection template that we have developed previously, but I will talk about it a bit later in the in the talk. We then go through a, a step, well, various steps for formatting. Uh, verification quality control, and these include checking for duplicates, for spelling errors, georeferencing, ascribing levels of geographic uh, precision, and checking for outlier locations, perhaps using geographic information systems uh, can be very useful. But we also do uh, use GeoQual, which is um, a tool uh, in Capfitogen, you see the link down here which also helps you to assess the quality of the georeferencing of your data. And so finally, uh, we end up having a, 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 a data set that then we analyze uh, doing species richness, assessing sampling bias, species distribution maps, predicting species distribution, distribution maps, etc. So I will go that more in detail. So again, uh, looking at the side of crop odd relatives, uh, this is just an overview of our current data. On the left, you have um, the number of gene bank accessions and on the right, the number of herbarium records. And species richness uh, in these slides. On the left, you have observed taxon richness. So basically uh, looking at the uh, current, um, the current data or records that we have collated. And on the right, we have the predicted taxon richness. Um, so using species distribution modeling. And you see uh, South Africa here as being a, a hotspot, as everyone knows, but also for crop pod relatives. And then we go to complementarity analysis. And this is an, uh, an iterative process that identifies the minimum number of sites that are needed to conserve all priority taxa. And, they, and this can be based on a grid or on an existing network of protected areas. And the latter is usually used to assess the representativeness of taxa in the network. That's and it can be represented at various levels, at species level, at ecogeographic level, genetic level. So an example, Zambia, pop out relatives. Um, on the left, you have uh, that 13 uh, complementary grids of 5 by 5 kilometers 
are needed to conserve all 21 priority crop other relatives for Zambia. And on the right hand side, you have uh, the same analysis done for uh, the, the existing protected area network. So 10 protected areas are needed to conserve 18 crop out relatives, and the remaining three occur outside protected areas exclusively. So they are, they, there's a need to identify additional sites for these priority uh, crop out relatives. Gap analysis. So it is a conservation evaluation technique that identifies gaps in conservation. It involves a comparison between the range of natural diversity and the diversity effectively conserved in situ, and this is called in situ gap analysis, or uh, the comparison between the range of natural diversity and the accessions of the species that are represented in gene bank collections. And this is called ex situ gap analysis. And it can be done at various levels of species, ecographic, genetic diversity level, um, et cetera. So uh, on the left, you have in situ gap analysis. So first of all, you identify species that do not occur within existing protected areas. And these are the gaps. But then you also identify species that do occur within existing protected areas but that, that are not actively managed. And you can also identify gaps at infraspecific level. And this can be uh, ecogeographic diversity that is not already conserved in situ. On the right, you have ex situ gap analysis. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, still an in situ gap analysis. So first, you just have to overlay species distribution or ecogeographic diversity within with the network of protected areas. And you should also review in situ conservation projects just to see whether there is uh, any active management and monitoring of species uh, 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 being undertaken for your target species. On the right, you have ex situ gap analysis. So it's just a matter of identifying the facts that are not conserved ex situ, and these are the gaps, and also identify gaps at infra specific level. And it can be ecogeographic diversity that is not conserved in gene banks. It's a simple comparison between species distribution and the existing ex situ accessions. And ecogeographic diversity analysis can be undertaken as well in, in capfitogen, um, which you can find in this link. So again, for the silo crop wide relatives, uh, we have concluded they are uh, very poorly conserved, both ex situ and in situ. In fact, 50% are not conserved ex situ, and those of those that are conserved ex situ, 40% have less than five populations, and 60% have only one population. And uh, regarding in situ, 17% of the species out occur outside protected areas exclusively, and those that occur within protected areas are not monitored or actively managed. Okay, um, we want to conserve species diversity, but we also want to conserve genetic diversity within these species. Uh, genetic diversity is very important because it, it is, uh, it, is uh, it, it basically uh, is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a way that species uh, have to be able to adapt to different environments, to, to changing environments, and, and so, this genetic diversity information it is usually lacking and so uh, ecogeographic diversity is perhaps can be used as a proxy of this genetic diversity so we have the, um, created an elc map an ecogeographic land characterization map uh, and in this case uh, we we aimed at describing the different environments of the territory so we used 16 generalist variables that you can see in this table on the left using the Kalinsky, Kalinsky method and using again capfitogen to produce this map. Um, I will uh, tell you later how this geographic diversity, the ge ge geographic diversity sorry, can be used uh, to recommend sites for in-situ conservation and ex-situ conservation. But for now, we I just want to show you how um, uh, one, one, answer, one question that we have to make, which is how is climate change predicted to affect plant diversity? So again, in the Southern region, for crop relatives, we uh, use these two scenarios on the left, 
uh, a predicted increase of 2.06 Celsius degrees, and on the right a bit more, 2.55. And these maps show a change of taxon richness, where the, the darkest uh, orange and red uh, um, show where uh, the number of tax, uh, or the number of, uh, the highest number of tax that disappear, that are disappearing. So uh, the highest negatively change in taxon richness. So uh, uh, the countries uh, here, so with the uh, red and orange bars, they are those that have a, a higher decrease in the number of priority crop out relatives. And these are at species level, so we have the winners, so those species that actually uh, will win with climate change, will gain uh, territory, and the losers, those ones that will lose more uh, suitable, suitable habitat. Okay, so where should we actively conserve priority taxa in situ? So basically, we want to conserve in situ the whole range of ecotographic diversity for each species, but we want to conserve populations that actually persist in the future with climate change. And here you have an example with a wild relative of rice, or, or is a longistaminata. On the left-hand side, you have an, the ELC map with the different ecogeographic categories, and the yellow dots are the species distribution. And basically, we want to conserve populations from different uh, ecogeographic categories because they are adapted to different environments. And on the right hand side you have uh, um, a climate change analysis for these species. So the, the green areas are those uh, where the, the impact of climate change is either uh, gaining areas, so um, light green, or where uh, the impact is very low uh, in darker green and in red and orange those are very uh, th those that are negatively impacted areas so basically what we are looking for is for these populations that occur in the low impact areas in those green areas because we know that well we expect them to be there in the future with climate change how, how do we then um, combine these we then run a complementary, a complementary analysis in order to identify those populations that persist in the future uh, and those ecogeographic diversity and that ecogeographic diversity for each species. Um, that, uh, so the aim is to conserve the whole range of ecogeographic diversity of each, each species. Um, and for these, uh, and as much as possible for those populations that persist in the future. So we end up having 133 protected areas in 13 countries that cover 89 proper abilities plus their 50% of their ecogeographic diversity. And so for the remaining, remaining ecogeographic diversity and those 21 crop relatives not included in the first uh, complementarity network, uh, then we run a different complementarity analysis for those remaining uh, species and diversity. And we have identified 163 sites in 13 countries. So Democratic Republic of Congo, South Africa and Tanzania are very important areas for conserving crop and relative diversity predicted not to be negatively impacted by climate change. And okay, where should we then collect for ex situ conservation? So our first priority is uh, those areas of ecogeographic diversity not conserved ex situ and that is likely to disappear with climate change. And these are our results and a close up. And you see in, in red uh, here in the RC, these are the, 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 the richest areas in terms of ecogeographic diversity not conserved and that is likely to disappear with climate change. So this is where we should focus our target, our focus. Should, this is where should we, we should talk, target our um, efforts, sorry. And we concluded that 39% of corporate relatives uh, will lose ecogeographic diversity with climate change. And perhaps uh, and millet, scalpy and eggplant wild relatives are the most affected. And Gaul and DRD are the most important areas for, to conserve this diversity. And priority two, 
are those uh, predicted richness areas of the remaining ecogeographic diversity not conserved ex situ, uh, regardless of whether they are negatively impacted by climate change or not. And so these are the, our priority to go collecting areas. Again, Angola, DRC, and several other countries in the in the Sadak region are important areas for studying uh, ecogeographic diversity of copper dwellings not conserved already in the ex situ. Okay, uh, almost uh, finishing. So, plant conservation planning tools we it, they they were developed because we felt the need to guide and facilitate systematic conservation planning and to develop uh, national strategic action plans. They promote data sharing and standardization of data management, and they aim at minimizing errors and time costs. And again, this flow chart, where you see plant diversity on one side, using the conservation planning tools to conserve, uh, to plan for conservation, and, and finally, uh, the national strategic action plans. So we have developed uh, five tools for conservation planning. We've developed an interactive toolkit for uh, conservation planning, a checklist and inventory template, and a current data collection template. And for national strategic action plans, we developed two templates that help in the preparation of these sensors. They are freely available online, and although they were developed for proper dwellers, we think that they can be applied and used to any wild plant group. So again, this slide. So the first one, I think is the most important one, is the interactive toolkit for uh, cooperative conservation planning. Um, sorry, this is not... Ah. The checklist inventory data template, data template, which can be used to generate the plan checklist and also to prioritize taxa. And the occurrence data collection template that will help them prepare the data for this diversity gap and climate change analysis. And finally, the technical, uh, the National Strategic Action Plan template and the technical background document, which basically should go together with the NSAP that holds all the scientific and the academic data and results that we have produced in, in our conservation planning. So the interactive toolkit for uh, conservation planning can be found in these websites. As I said, it's freely available. The only thing you need is to register to use it. And not only includes brief introduction to each of the conservation planning step, but uh, provides uh, several uh, examples. But most central to it are the flowcharts, the interactive flowcharts that you can uh, uh, use and they they can be adapted to your own context. So they are interactive in that way. There is also a big list of references that can be consulted um, uh, for each conservation planning step. Then the checklist and inventory data template, this was done for cooperate relatives, uh, as I said, uh, and this is the publication we have, uh, well, published in 2017. And this is the tool how it looks like. It was developed in Excel because it's widely used and um, so it, we thought it was better to use uh, developing in Excel and it has been used in these areas. The current data collection template helps you to collect data from various sources, so from gene bank accessions, uh, herbarium specimens, um, field observations, uh, bibliographic references, um, experts uh, also personal communications and helps you to standardize all this data and prepare the data for the subsequent analysis. It also helps you to prepare data to use in Capitogen uh, if you are using that for, for your planning. And this is also developed in Excel based on various descriptors that already uh, that were developed before uh, from other various publications and, and uh, projects. And it has been also used in this in these regions. National strategic action plans. Uh, they have been uh, these three that you see here. They have been developed using the templates that I told you, and they have been published and endorsed by the relevant ministries. So in Zambia, Mauritius, and South Africa. So they were very useful for this purpose and helped the countries to to 
is that the national strategic action plans. Okay, to finalize and complete this flow chart, we have plant diversity, use the planning tools for conservation planning. The results of that then feed onto national strategic action plans. We then do in situ and exit conservation. And, and, and Asian will be talking about in situ implementation, conservation implementation afterwards. And finally, we end with the utilization of diversity, which I think Nigel will also talk about. So over to you, Ishan. Jo Joanna and Ishan, just just before you you start, just just check in with people if they've got any questions. And Ishan, I'll, I'll um, share the screen with you just now as well. Um, uh, but uh, if, if you have a question for Joanna on anything she's presented up to now, either if you want to write it in the chat box, or you can unmute your microphone, and then I can see. Um, who'd like to ask a question, we can queue them up. And we'll just take a, a, a couple of questions just now, um, if, there, if there are any. Um, but whilst you have a, a quick think about that, uh, um, Joanna, I have one, and that was I mean, some fantastic set of resources um, to support planning at kind of various scales. Um, you mentioned a number of values in there about, you know, could we need to obviously prioritise for for, for climate change and we want to maximize genetic diversity, et cetera. But these are these are all value judgments rather than than facts. And I just wondered in terms of the planning process, is is there is the assumption that those people, uh, the organizations, the countries involved in doing the planning will make their choices as to what they care about most and that and the and the resources are flexible to to that, to their choice about what's most important to them. Um, leave it at that as a question mark. Can they can apply their own values to, to decide on priorities and, and therefore where, um, you know, how the map turns out and, uh, and what their actions, where they might target actions? Yes, so um, in our work, we usually, well, we try to involve um, stakeholders, all stakeholders uh, that are um, well, involved in the conservation of these resources mm -hmm. in planning and conservation. Also, um, just to make sure that not only everyone is happy with it, but also that implementation will be, uh, you know, more, will be facilitated because they were taking into account during the process. So we actually involve them in various stages. We involve them in prioritizing and we have them uh, uh, for example, um, uh, national workshops in Jordan, uh, where we, 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 first of all, we, we produce documents and uh, explaining the method, the different methodologies, the different criteria, and people voted in which criteria and method they wanted to. And after uh, we prioritize them, the species, and uh, the species would then were well, they actually they went through a not not very formal review, but um, for example, when I was explaining the results and presenting those results, there were people saying, "Okay, these are not these are invasive species, or these are weeds. We don't want to conserve them." And so, and these were people from various uh, backgrounds, from uh, nature conservation, from plant genetic resources, from various backgrounds. So. Uh, we then refine that list. And in other cases, uh, in Africa, for example, in, in um, South Africa, for example, from right from the beginning, the prioritization, they involved uh, uh, so people from uh, in-situ conservation, from biodiversity conservation, but also from the breeders, um, uh, from Breeder Institute, but also from the plant genetic uh, exitu conservation um, in order to develop not only the checklist of species, but also to prioritize these species. And then after all, all the, the, the stakeholders, all the relevant national stakeholders, including, including ministries, uh, representatives, and various, uh, uh, well, even, even NGOs were presented, were present. They were also invited and, and were invited to attend a workshop where these things were, were discussed. So we tend to 
what our aim is always to actually produce something that can be taken up forward. It's not something very academic. So we tend to invite people to workshops to discuss these and just to make sure that they actually uh, are happy with, with, with what we are doing. Not just us, because we, in Birmingham Biovacid, we help the countries to, to do this. So they actually are the ones that, the, the ones that own the, the work. So, okay. thank, you. thank you very much, Joanna. Um, Joanna, I'm just going to pass now the presenter over to Eshan, and uh, hopefully then he can pick that up, uh, and then we can carry on, Eshan, with um, with your part of the presentation. Okay, I hope you can all hear me. So yeah. I'm going to follow on uh, to what um, Joanna has just been talking about. Okay, so yeah, so Joanna gave you a, a very good um, account on how we do conservation planning. Now the next step in this whole process is uh, once you've identified your sites where you want uh, your populations of crop wild relative to be conserved, then the next step is to uh, discuss, you know, what exactly you need to do about it. Now, perhaps it is useful. I, I know, looking at the attendees to this uh, uh, webinar, uh, you're all experts in, in 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 conservation issues. So I'm sure you all know this definition of in situ conservation from the CBD by heart by now, uh, since it was developed in 1992. But it really tells us. Uh, what exactly we are talking, sorry, uh, trying to minimize uh, the side glass here. Okay. Yeah, so it, it really tells you what in situ conservation is all about. Um, basically, we are talking about natural habitats. We are talking about natural ecosystem. And what we want to do with those is to ensure that the wild populations of the species we want to conserve are well maintained or if they are not well maintained, if they are disappearing, they are declining, we want to recover uh, these populations that will be viable for the longer term. So that's what in situ conservation is about. But this definition also relates to those uh, plants, uh, species that are cultivated and are not grown in wild habitats, but are grown on, uh, um, on farm and are managed by farmers. So it's mostly the, the on-farm conservation. I tend to uh, always, when I talk about in situ conservation, to really differentiate between in situ conservation per se in this sense of strict version, referring to the wild species in their wild habitats and to on-farm conservation, which is about maintaining those varieties cultivated by farmers. Obviously, the, the, the factors that drive the conservation of those two entities, if you want, are very different from each other and very often also um, um, relates to different stakeholders, different actors that come into play in terms of how these uh, diversity are conserved. So I think that's a very important distinction to make here. Uh, in this webinar, we're going to focus mostly on the wild species part, but some of the arguments that I'm going to talk about is also applied to, to on-farm conservation. So just to make a few key points about in situ conservation, Joanna mentioned it uh, at the beginning of her talk. We are talking here about uh, uh, in situ conservation being part of the wall uh, conservation work, i.e. It, it, it should be seen as a complementarity to ex situ conservation. After we hear debates about, you know, in situ conservation should be the primary uh, uh, means or method or techniques for conservation, while ex situ comes to back up that collection. 
but it really depends on from which context we are looking at it. I would argue that we really need to look at conservation in a much more holistic manner. Uh, both are important in their own right, and they all perhaps serves perhaps different function as well. As you all know, when we talk about in situ conservation here, we are talking about maintaining the evolutionary capacity of these populations to evolve with time. That's why we need to keep those uh, in situ uh, viable because we don't know what resources we will need for the future. So it's very important to allow that uh, diversity to evolve with time, particularly with the challenges and impact of climate change that we are facing. We need to generate those diversities that are more adapted to the new environments that are coming up. Whereas ex situ conservation is much more from a utilitarian point of view. It makes the materials more accessible uh, to uh, the users of germplasm, being farmers or breeders. So both of them are, are very important. So when we talk about in situ, it's, as I said earlier, it's really trying to enable the maintenance of that diversity within the ecosystem, viable and uh, alive here. Now, in situ conservation can also take uh, two different types of approaches. We could have a species-centered approach. Uh, if we're interested in particular crop or relatives of coffee, for example, or any other species for that matter, endangered species that we want to, to maintain. So we can take a very much species-centered approach and develop um, restoration program or recovery program for these particular species. Or else we can take a more general uh, ecosystem-based approach where we are really targeting uh, a whole landscape uh, which is threatened by deforestation or land erosion or whatever. So there are different ways in which you can approach than in situ conservation. Traditionally, um, I would say that um, the way that we've been doing in situ conservation over the decades now is uh, through the establishment of protected areas. So protected areas has really been the cornerstone of conservation if we look at it uh, uh, from this angle. But we should recognize as well that there are many uh, species, many ecosystems that are not protected because we cannot protect everything. And many important sites, as Joanna uh, illustrated uh, in the conservation planning section, that there are many crop war relatives, for example, that are located outside protected area. That doesn't mean that uh, these populations cannot be conserved in situ, but they, they, we need to develop mechanism and, and see how uh, these species, these uh, landscape can be conserved in situ. So uh, it requires a different perhaps approaches uh, as to when we talk about protected areas. Okay, oops, I'm going too far here. So what does it mean uh, to implement conservation then? Well, one of the first thing we would do is to understand what are the threats or the drivers that are affecting the populations that we are trying to, to conserve. So it's usually done by uh, doing a, a, a threat analysis, so we could apply the IUCN red list uh, uh, assessment to, to look at the conservation status of those species that we are interested in. And once we know what the threats are, what the drivers are, then we can define a number of measures, it really depends on a case by case basis, what we need measures to be to be implemented so that we can reduce these threats and allow these population to uh, to to grow in in that in that habitat for example if the threat is about uh, invasive species which is the case for many tropical islands in this world then one of the major factors is to do uh, control of those invasive species uh, as we have done very successfully here in, in Mauritius um, also very important if we are to be successful 
it is very important that we have the appropriate uh, regulatory framework and the policy framework uh, in place. Some of them may already be in a protected area, so there's already a, a legislation that govern these protected areas and a, an authority, a management authority, can be a national park authority or a forestry authority or whatever, depending on country to country that would manage that and what sort of policies they have in place that will enable uh, these conservation actions to be implemented. And it often relates to the issue about land tenure. If we are aiming for long-term conservation, it's absolutely essential that we have the land tenure to allow these, these uh, species to be protected over the long term. If those species are found on uh, private lands, then we do need to have uh, uh, an agreement with those uh, private owners to make them understand the importance and the value of these resources and uh, get their agreement in terms of setting aside some of those areas for long-term protection and uh, establishing a protection system and obviously enforcing these it would be very important as well. I mean, the crux of uh, in-situ uh, activities is to actually do the conservation, implement the conservation measures, which often uh, involve uh, uh, developing a restoration plan for the sites, implementing those plights. It can be uh, having to raise uh, the populations uh, maybe in a nursery or on site itself in temporary nurseries to have the planting material to replant into those areas. Uh, often um, species could be lost but are present or conserved in ex situ facilities, in botanic gardens uh, or in, in gene banks and these materials can be uh, multiplied and made available and brought back for re reintroduction in, in their original sites or even in, in new sites so that we re-establish these populations in situ. So also for some target species, we can develop recovery programs for them in this way. So all this will allow then uh, the in situ to take place, the in situ conservation to take place. But uh, what is also important is for us to be able to say how successful we are in our conservation efforts. And for this, it is important that we put in place uh, monitoring uh, program plans so that we can uh, measure the extent to which we are successful, uh, not only to measure short term uh, impacts changes in the target population, but also medium or long term. Very often we think that we are doing the right thing, but by through monitoring, we might uh, you know, realize that, well, it's not going as we wish it would be, so we might need to review our implementation strategy and to see where we've gone wrong or what we need to do better. So these monitoring programs is absolutely essential for ensuring, uh, measuring how successful we are, but also guiding us on what changes we need to make in our in intervention plan. Um, for, for this, it's very, very important that we put in place uh, an effective information and documentation system so that we capture our success, but also our mistakes that we are doing in our conservation intervention. So all that is, is very important. Another, I think, very important aspect, uh, particularly in cases uh, where you have an intimate relationship between a, a site or a protected area with local communities is to you know embrace these people in your conservation activities very important to document the knowledge of local people of the indigenous people about uh, the use the conservation and of, of or just the knowledge that they know about those uh, uh, indigenous species and uh, uh, and learn from that. And this takes me to the next slide, is how do you communicate and involve uh, these local stakeholders? When we talk about stakeholders here, they can be quite broad. They can be from policymakers to scientists, to breeders, to farmers, to um, protected area managers, uh, um, 
other other scientists in, in general, university academics, and uh, but also the local uh, people that lives in this area. So each of these different stakeholders may require different approaches on how we communicate what is important about the work we are doing in a particular area, be it from scientific publication to policy brief uh, to blogs, uh, etc. But here I would like to focus a little bit more um, yes, sorry. sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm just aware. I'm aware of the time, and obviously, and and people kind of having other things going on as well. So, um, um, just as a sort of a heads up to you. Yeah, that's the last slide. So go quickly oh, for right, that. Fantastic. Right. I'll, right? I'll shut up. Okay. Yeah. So, so I think it's very, very important that we engage right from the start with local stakeholders when we embark on an in situ conservation. Often it all, it involves organizing focus group discussion with these important, and these focus group discussion help us to raise the awareness about the local uh, biodiversity, which might be an inherent part of their lives. So bringing out the value of what these uh, target species have for for themselves, but also for the world. And often these uh, discussion group help us to also to learn from those people because they have a much more intricate relationship with the biodiversity there. So there might be things that we learn from them and particularly understand what sort of benefits they are getting from the protected area or from those species that we are interested in. In this way, we are sort of winning over the ownership uh, of the work by these local people, which will really help us in our conservation intervention to reduce any conflicts that may arise from the work we're doing. And often one of the key things we need to try and do in in situ conservation is look at what sort of incentive mechanism that we can establish to ensure a long-term conservation of those target species and ecosystems so that it benefits both the local people there, but also the larger community of stakeholders and the conservation goals that we are trying to achieve here. So with this, I pass over to Nigel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yashan. And um, I will um, pass to Nigel. Um, Nigel, you, you, uh, that's a, it, it's difficult when you're uh, coming in at the uh, coming in at the end. Um, I don't know how many slides you have uh, left. I'm just aware of the time coming up for half past. So I'll, I'll hand over to you to to, um, to finish off. Hopefully, you've got now the uh, the the uh, the control of the screen. All right, Nigel, can you see that? If you just, I think you just have to accept it. There should be a share button on the bottom left, right, I think. Yeah. Ah, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yes, yes. Did you um, have you managed to see? There's a, there should be an invite to take on the presenter role. Right. Uh, share entire screen. Share. I'm sorry, Jamie. It says share. I'm clicking on it, but nothing happens. Um. Can, but have you accepted the presenter role? Um. This conference will now be recorded in terms of the ecosystem services they provide. But currently that diversity is being threatened both at the taxonomic level, so species are disappearing, but also in terms of genetic diversity as well. Genetic diversity is disappearing uh, from um, populations that aren't conserved. Also because of that potential use and the threat that they're facing, there is increased global attention now being paid for in situ and ex situ conservation of those taxa. So the tools that we've developed um, in terms of crop wild relative conservation can be applied uh, for all plant species. So the take home message is really that um, the work we've been doing on crop wild relative conservation is applicable for all um, the methodologies and the tools we've developed are applicable for all forms um, of conservation. And that I'll hand back to Jamie for further discussion.
Thank you very much for that, Nigel, and uh, and thanks for for for, uh, for dealing with the technological um, issues there um, very coolly. Um, and uh, I'm aware that we've kind of run over by by ten, so um, I don't want to, to hold people for uh, for too long. But I want to do sort of open it up to see if there are some questions. Uh, I know that um, Fred uh, Pilkington has made a, a comment that. Um, um, where he's talking about it being an you know, amazing talk, great piece of research um, and application, and is wondering if there are plans to do similar analyses for other regions of the world. Perhaps I could answer that as I've still got my microphone open. In that, um, well, the answer is yes, definitely. One of the things that, that Joanna, Aishan and I have been dreaming about for our research over the last few years is setting up a, a global network for in situ conservation and use. Um, and initially we had the grand idea that we would do this all in one go, which perhaps was rather naive of us to have thought of that. So we're now doing it on a regional basis. So we're starting off in Europe. We have European funding to set up an in situ uh, network in Europe. Um, and then recently, Aishan has just obtained uh, some funding uh, from the Darwin Initiative to do uh, crop wild relative conservation planning in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we're talking about now moving on as well to South America. So we do plan to try and cover the world with the, the, the approach to conservation and conservation planning we're currently using. So the answer is definitely yes. May I just add something else? No, I was just saying, I was just saying that at national level, various countries have already applied this methodology: uh, Mexico, uh, Norway, Jordan, but also currently Malawi, Indonesia, Tanzania, and so there are many uh, many countries that are currently doing this uh, approach for conservation of, of crop relatives and their resources. <laughs> Thank you, Joanna. And if you do have any questions, we'll take uh, one or two last ones, either in the chat box, which I'm looking at, or if people turn their microphones on. Um, and whilst we just wait for that, Joanna, just just in response to that, have you found that when they've been using the process that they're modifying it at all, um, or is it is it kind of does it seem to be pretty much you know fit for purpose? Um, yeah. The, so. The way yeah. So um, the process, the basic process uh, is, is the same uh, for all countries, for all regions. So starting with the checklist, prioritizing, uh, collecting information, current data, and then doing the diversity analysis. But of course, the level in, into uh, each country or each region goes into the diversity analysis is changing, changes. Uh, so some countries prefer to do a more superficial analysis and the countries prefer to do a more in-depth analysis. So using climate change, ecogeographic diversity. So it does depend, but basically the, the, the concept and the methodology, methodology used is, is the same. Mm -hmm. That, that I think is 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 very is a very powerful and I think an important element of any tool is that ability to respond to the depth which you know which a group or you know is looking to go into at that particular point you know how flexible is it which seems like it is uh, and it is a um, clearly a fantastic um, suite of tools and, and a process that allows you to plan for multiple species across multiple countries uh, as you want to, and go into it in, in a variety of depth. Um, one last question from Suzanne and then we'll, we'll wrap up so people can carry on with it. Uh, or whatever it is. So Suzanne is asking, are there any examples of new areas being established specifically to crop wild relatives? Joanna, do you want to respond first to that? Or well, is it? Uh, as Nigel, I think Nigel was just talking about it. Uh, the first one in the UK is, is currently on, on its way. Uh, but, I, well, there are some examples where where sites have been identified to actively conserve protected areas, but formally established, I think probably the UK one is the first one, and perhaps uh, a couple of them, um, in, one in Armenia, but I'm not sure it was, uh, well, I know it hasn't been established following this methodology, but perhaps Nigel can answer that. 
Yes, yeah, so, I mean, the, the first time we've been recognised formally by the government of the country um, are four sites in Germany who've been uh, set up explicitly for conserving apium species, crop wild relatives and apium, so wild relatives of celery. Um, uh, but we also, as, as Joanna gave that long list of countries, each one of them has uh, to a certain level established uh, crop active in situ crop wild relative conservation. One of the one of the problems we have is that countries, although they we may be able to identify where to set up uh, in situ conservation of crop wild relatives, and we may be able to work with the local protected area managers to actually do the in situ conservation, it's formal recogni formal recognition by the government which is becoming uh, is, is slightly more problematic because in terms of recognizing a site, then maybe the government fears that there's going to be some financial commitment to additional management of the site. So uh, something we, we, we would never have been aware of before that would become a, a problem in terms of limiting um, conservation is this, this fear by governments of taking on additional uh, financial commitments. Um, but one of the interesting things that is the truth is that um, in terms of managing um, on uh, uh, in situ conservation of crop wild relatives in protected areas, the additional financial contribution is actually very limited because if you have, if you identify a site because it has a healthy population of crop wild relatives, then effectively the management that is existing at that site is good for those crop wild relatives. So there is no um, additional a financial commitment apart from the actual active monitoring of the crop wild relatives at the site to make sure they they're maintained at the site in perpetuity. Nigel, Eshan and Joanna, thank you so much for that fascinating talk and uh, as Joanna pointed out earlier on there's the, the the website and the tools are there freely available so so go and take advantage of them um, and um, thank you very much for everyone for, for staying with us um, and we'll give you a heads up for the next uh, webinar that uh, is being organized but um, thank you to the presenters um, everybody have a very good day. Say one thing before you go. So yes, if, absolutely. If anyone listening would like uh, follow up uh, recommendations of the literature, or if we went uh, too fast in any specific section, if they email any of the three of us, then I'm sure we can provide follow up information and more detailed guidance in terms of where to get the appropriate uh, documentation from. Thanks very much, Nigel. And if you don't have their emails, you will have mine. So um, just contact me and I'll put you straight in touch. So all the best to everybody. And um, uh, we'll be in touch again for a later webinar. Bye for now. Thank you.